We're going to talk about section 2.1, input and output. So uh, we're going to find some output values here, and we're going to use our functional notation. So our function is given as f of x equals negative 3x squared plus 2x minus 1, and we want to evaluate that at negative 2. So we say f of negative 2 is equal to, and then we're going to plug in negative 2 everywhere we see the x. And then we'll follow our order of operations. So squaring first, negative 2 squared is positive 4. So that's going to make that negative 3 times positive 4. And then a 2 times negative 2 is a negative 4. And we still have that minus 1 hanging out there. Negative 3 times negative 4 is negative 12. And then minus 4 minus 1. So that's going to get us to negative 17. So let's look at a little more challenging question, still the same function, but now let's see if we can talk about what is f of x plus h. So we are going to plug this x plus h in for all of the x's and then carefully follow the order of operations. So we have negative 3 times x plus h quantity squared plus 2 times x plus h and then the minus 1. So uh, our shortcut for squaring that out is going to be first one squared, that's x squared, plus twice the product is 2xh, and plus the second one squared is h squared. Distributing that 2 is going to make that be a 2x plus 2h, and the minus 1 is still hanging out. We'll distribute that negative 3 to get negative 3x squared minus 6xh minus 3h squared, and still we have the plus 2x plus 2h minus 1. Combining like terms, it looks like there's only the uh, 1x squared term, so that's going to be a negative 3x squared, and the negative 6xh is all by itself, that's the only one. And we, I guess all these others are singletons too. Not terribly interesting yet, but we'll try to, there's supposed to be an X in there. Let me make that more clear. We'll make it more interesting here shortly. So we get 3H squared, then the plus 2X plus 2H minus 1. So a little more interesting is let's look at F of X plus H minus F of X all over h. Okay, this is going to become our new favorite problem. So we just did the f of x plus h, so I'm going to borrow that answer right here and just import it into this question. So we've got the negative 3x squared minus 6xh minus 3h squared plus 2x plus 2h minus 1, and then we're going to subtract from that all of the f of x, so the quantity negative 3x squared plus 2x minus 1, all over h. So I'm going to distribute that negative sign here, and then the fun begins. So there's still the negative 3x squared minus 6xh minus 3h squared, plus 2x plus 2h minus 1. That's going to become then a plus 3x squared, a minus 2x, and a plus 1, still all over h. So if everything goes according to plan, anything without an h in it should cancel. So this negative 3x squared and that positive 3x squared will cancel. Let's see, this positive 2x and that negative 2x will cancel. The negative 1 and positive 1 will cancel. And so now I'm going to come down here. We've got negative 6xh minus 3h squared plus 2h, and I think that's it, all over h. Notice all of those has an h in the numerator, which means we can pull that out. We can factor that out as a greatest common factor. So that leaves behind negative 6x minus a 3h and a plus 2. That h we factored out can cancel with that h in the denominator. This is always going to happen, so our final answer is going to be negative 6x minus 3h 
plus two. Those sure are fun. Okay, so let's talk about for a moment. If we said a is equal to pi r squared, then what would a of 10 equal? So we would just plug uh, the 10 in for that r, and squaring that would be 100, so it would be 100 pi. So there's the first question, and the more interesting in one is, uh, what does it mean is what I'm going to ask you here. So in the context of a problem here, what does this mean? So hopefully we recognize that a equals pi r squared is the area of a circle with an area a and a radius r. So what are what we have just found here, the significance of that is that uh, the area of a circle with radius 10 is 100 pi. Okay, does that kind of make sense, hopefully? So let's now talk about some input values. Let's change directions. And uh, so where we just started, the part we just finished there, is we had a value of a function, and we plugged in a value of the independent variable in order to find a value of the dependent variable. So in the next problem, we're going to change that around. So here's our old cricket function, where the temperature is equal to one-fourth times the rate of chirping in chirps per minute plus 40. So we want to now uh, kind of turn this around. So we want to find the R when the temperature is 76 degrees. So we will plug in 76, the output value, that functional value, in for the T, and then we're going to solve this for the R. So adding the 40 to the other side is going to, I believe, make that 116. And if we then, um, oops, I'm sorry, I've got to subtract that 40. Oh, back up, back up, back up. So if I subtract that 40 to the other side, we'll get 36 is equal to 1 fourth R. And then if we multiply by 4, let's see, 4 times 30 is 120, 4 times 6 is 24, 120 plus the 24 is 144. So that would be, if we wanted units, remember that would be 144 chirps per minute in the context of this problem. Okay, a little different kind of question here. So now suppose that we have f of x is equal to 1 over the square root of x minus 4. So I'm going to ask you a couple of questions. First, so I'll say part a, can we find x when the f of x is equal to 2? So our strategy here is we're going to plug in the 2 where the f of x is, and now we have to figure out how to solve this equation for x. So there's a few different ways you can do it. So I'm going to just, let's get rid of the radical. I'm going to square both sides, although you don't have to do this first. That would make 4 equal to 1 squared is 1 over the x minus 4. Now there's several ways you can do this. You could multiply through by x minus 4. You could take the reciprocal of both sides. You could even make it into two fractions and cross multiply. Any of those would be uh, uh, correct mathematically. I'm going to take the reciprocal of both sides. It's kind of a personal favorite of mine, but you don't have to do it that way. And then if we add the 4 to the other side, we're going to get 4 and 1 fourth, or you could call that 17 fourths. Any of those is okay. Now, an uh, interesting question, here's the part B, is I'm going to ask the question, is there uh, an x value, so a value of x, an x value uh, that results in f of x equal to 
negative 2. So if we try this, if we plug in the negative 2 is equal to 1 over the square root of x minus 4, then uh, if we think about this carefully, the answer to a square root problem is non-negative. So whatever we get out of that square root can only be positive or zero, and since it's in the denominator of a fraction, it can't be zero either, or that would be undefined. So at any rate, this right side of the equal sign, no matter what value we plug in for x, is going to result in a positive, which means, no, there is no way for, there's no x value that's going to make that value of f of x equal to negative 2. Now suppose, let's see what happens if we didn't recognize that and we tried to proceed like we did before. When we square both sides, that negative part is going to go away and we are going to be right back to where we were before. And so if we solve this again, I'm going to take the reciprocal of both sides and I'm going to get again 4 and 1 fourth. Now the, the catch though is that if you try to plug this in to our original and, uh, and plug in that 4 and 1 fourth, you're going to get negative 2 is equal to 1 over the square root of 4 and 1 fourth minus 4. That's going to be negative 2 is equal to 1 over the square root of 4 and a fourth minus 4 is 1 fourth. The square root of 1 fourth is the square root of 1 over the square root of 4. And to multiply by a half is, or to divide by a half is to multiply by its reciprocal. We're going to, this is claiming that negative 2 is equal to positive 2, but that's not true. So there actually is no uh, solution to that. Okay, I'm going to get a new screen here, and then we'll uh, continue our talk. So I'm back. I paused it for a moment so I could write this down and we could be a little more efficient. So we have R equals F of T is the revenue in millions of dollars from NFL Network TV as a function of T, the number of years since 1975. And you can see in the table the T and the R of T written there. So the first question we're going to try to answer is to evaluate and interpret R of 15. So this is something we can just read right from the graph. So we have or a table actually. So here we have our function is given as a table. So we would say uh, that that's the, the function given numerically. So we can read that when uh, the t is 15, the r is going to be 900. So we would say that r of 15 is equal to 900. And kind of going the other way in part b, solve and interpret r of t equals 2600. So in the, the row where the r of t is, we can see that where the 2600 is, and the value of t that generates that is going to be the 30. So that's how we're going to get that t is equal to 30. Now, to, well, let me, I should back up because I didn't do an interpretation here. So the interpretation, given the context of our problem, is that 15 years after 1975, so that would be in 1990, the TV revenue, the TV revenue was... Nine hundred, uh, nine hundred million dollars. Okay, using those correct units. So when you when you ask to interpret, you want to make sure you you use the correct units and think about that. So back here uh, to part B again. Now we have solved it that t is equal to thirty. The interpretation is going to be that thirty years from nineteen. 75, so that is in the year 2005, uh, the TV revenue, the TV revenue will reach 2600, or 2600 million dollars. Okay, again, we're using the limits that were given to us there. 
And now finally in part C, it's saying uh, find the average rate of change of TV revenue from 1990 to 2005. So remember, 1975 is time zero. So that means that 1990 is really going to be, T is going to be 15, and uh, 2005 is going to be when T is 30. So we are talking about these two points right there. And so remember, average rate of change, our average rate of change, is going to be our change in y over the change in x, or we can also say f of b minus f of a over b minus a if we're going to use functional notation. So that's going to be the 2600 minus the 900, and then our b minus a is going to be 30 minus 15. So let's see, 2600 minus the 900, I think, is going to be 1,700. And if we divide that by 15, oh, goodness, let's see. I know that, let's see, 15, let's see, 5 goes into there three times. And so 5 goes into 10 twice. I think that's going to be 340. And that's not going to be divisible, so I'm going to just leave it as 340 over 3. Um, and my calculator is not handy, so I'm just going to leave it as that. That The units on that are going to be the Y units, which are going to be in millions of dollars. And then that's going to be per the the T units, which is in years. So that's the, that's the rate at which the TV revenue is growing in millions of dollars per year. So let's look at uh, a couple different kinds of examples here. So I want to bring some other kinds of problems into play. So let's say that f of x is equal to x to the third minus 4x. And let's see if we can, first of all, solve where is f of x equal to 0. So we're going to take our f of x, set that equal to 0. Now, it's been a while, but we're going to factor out a greatest common factor. And I believe that's going to get us to x times x squared minus 4. We can hopefully recognize x squared minus 4 as the difference of two squares. And then we can set each of those equal to zero. And so we will get zero, two, and negative two. So the next question I want to ask is, uh, for what value, so for what value of x is f of x greater than zero. So this is a different kind of question. So we're going to kind of piggyback off what we just did there, and I'm going to put in a number line here. So look at that number line. I'm going to put in the places where f of x could be zero, the x values that make f of x equal to zero, and that's going to be negative 2, 0, and 2. So since we are talking about f of x being strictly greater than zero, these values are not going to be solutions because those are going to make f of x equal to zero. In fact, I'm going to change colors and put a little blue circle. Now, that's going to divide our number line into one, two, three, four different regions. Now, my claim is that in, in those, in, if you pick one of those regions, the value of f of x will either be positive or negative, but it won't change because the only places it can change sign is a place where it's first equal to zero. So I'm going to pick a representative from this far left region, like say negative three. When I plug negative three into, and I like to use the factored form, then I'm just worried about the sign. This negative three is going to be negative. Negative three minus two is also going to be negative. Negative three plus two is going to also be negative. When those multiply each other, a negative times a negative times a negative, the result will be negative which is not 
greater than zero, which means there are no solutions to the left of negative two, which means I'm gonna leave that blank. I'm gonna pick a, re a representative uh, between negative two and zero, say negative one, and I'm gonna do the same thing. Now this is still negative, negative one minus two is still negative, but now negative one plus two has become positive. And a negative times a negative times a positive is positive, which is going to be greater than zero, which means everything in here is going to be a solution. It's going to make f of x greater than zero. Similarly, plugging in a representative between zero and two, like say positive one, will make this positive, but the x minus two will remain negative, and that's going to make this region be negative, which is not a solution. And finally, plugging in something to the right of two, like three, like say positive three, is gonna make all three of those positives, which is also positive. So there's a graph of the answer to our question, what values of x make that f of x positive. And so to write that, we can do this a couple of ways. We can use any quality notation and say negative two, less than x, less than zero, and I'm gonna use the word or, and then x strictly greater than two. And I'm gonna put it in braces because that's really a solution set, but uh, I wouldn't take it off if you didn't put the braces on there. Now, alternatively, I don't know if you're familiar with interval notation, but in interval notation, you could say like a bracket one, a bracket one comma three, bracket is one less than or equal to x less than or equal to three a bracket zero comma four parentheses is zero less than or equal to x strictly less than four. So to make these strict inequalities, we could go negative two zero using parentheses or, and then we could go two to infinity. So that is known as interval notation, which would also work. Okay, now you could also show this graphically, so I'm gonna run this by you real quick. So graphically, and at this point in time, you could graph this on your graphing calculator. <clears throat> we'll talk m much more about how to do this later. Uh, we're not really quite ready to do it yet, but if we we're gonna graph this on an x-y axis, we would see that these places that made x that made the f of x equal to zero uh, are going to be x intercepts on our graph, and we could figure out what's happening to the far left and see that it's going to do something like this. So you can see from this graph that this part of the curve, these two parts of the curve, are where f of x is greater than zero and the x values that generate that part of the curve are exactly what we came up with using just our number line. That's kind of a different way of looking at that. Okay, I'm gonna get a new screen and do one more example here. So I'm back, I paused it again to kind of jot this stuff down to make things go a little quicker. So we have f of x is 2x minus 3 and g of x is x plus 1. So those are both straight lines. And the question is, for what values of x is f of x greater than or equal to g of x? So I'm going to put the graph of f of x in yellow. So it's going to have a y-intercept of negative 3. It's going to have a slope of 2, so I'm going to do rise over run, get those, and this is kind of a rough sketch of y equals f of x. So we'll come back to that. I'm going to do the g of x I'm going to do in green. Whoops. I didn't want to do that. Let me put that back, and let me see if I can go with green. So here the y-intercept is positive 1 and the slope is positive one. So this is gonna do something like that. So using your imagination a little bit, that's gonna be the g of x. So the point being that right here is where these two are going to intersect each other. And we're interested in is where is the f of x, that is the yellow, 
greater than or equal to the g of x, the green. And that's going to be the part of the graph that is over here, which is where the yellow is above the green. And that is going to be for these x values in here is what we're trying to find. So what we need to do first is figure out what, what is that point of intersection? What value of x is that where they intersect each other? And of course the way we're going to do this is to set f of x, the 2x minus 3, equal to the g of x, the x plus 1, and then we're going to solve that. So subtracting the x and adding the 3 gives us x is equal to 4. So that means that the x value where those two lines cross each other, where they intersect each other, is 4. And the part where f of x, the yellow, is above the green will be those values of x that go forever to the right. So we could say x greater than or equal to 4 would be perfectly correct. Or remember our um, interval notation, we could also say 4 comma infinity and we can never include infinity, so it gets the parentheses. Okay, very good. Hopefully you can do homework number nine now.